Rangers, welcome back. I'm excited to be back with you. We're here with Brother Lewis McClendon, and uh, today we're going to be continuing our study through Hosea. Today we're going to be specifically looking at Hosea chapters 6 and 7, and we're going to be looking at the idea of our relationship with God and how we can strengthen that relationship by evaluating two perspectives from those chapters. How are you doing, Brother Lewis? Doing good so far. Good. Well, thank you for being with us, and thank you for your um, your help in putting together these lessons and assembling them. I know that it's not an easy task, uh, especially when we're looking at a minor prophet like Hosea. But you started this idea kind of introducing us with the context of God laying charges against Israel. Can you walk us through a little bit of this context just so that we can catch up to chapter six? Right. Chapters four and five have been uh, very difficult chapters for the people because chapter number four God it just starts listing his charges against the people. And when you read through chapter four, you can see he, he specifically lists five of the Ten Commandments that they're breaking. And uh, then chapter five, he just, again, lets them know that he knows all their wicked ways and their thoughts and their deeds. So a lot of charges take place in chapters four and five. Then we move on to chapter six, where we can kind of begin looking at perspectives. So we're going to be looking at Israel's perspective. And then our Israel's perspective of God, and then vice versa, God's perspective of Israel. So let's begin. Uh, the first one we're looking at here is uh, through chapter 6 and 7 of Israel's perspective of, on, of God. Uh, beginning up in verse uh, 1 of chapter 6, it says, Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he, hath torn, uh, for he hath torn, and he hath healed us. He hath smitten, and he hath, we will bind us up. After two days will he revive us, and in the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know, and if we follow on to know the Lord, he, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. What we have here is just the fact that Israel and God are nowhere near on the same page. Israel's concept of God is just totally out of whack. And so that's why I've written this lesson this way, just to show the two differences, because we really run, run against this in our world all the time. I mean, the people we talk to on the street, their concept of God is not biblical in any sense of the word whatsoever. And really, Israel's concept of God is not biblical as well. And they start off these verses just, ob I mean, you look at these verses and you say, what great verses. Let's return to the Lord. He's torn us and he's going to heal us. He is smitten and he will bind us. But the truth of the matter is that's not the case. And we know this uh, by the rest of the chapter. Plus, in Hosea 7, three times he talks about that Israel did not return to him. So, I mean, it's, it's really painfully obvious that while this statement looks good, just on the surface reading of it, they don't mean anything they're saying. What they're looking for is for God to solve their problems and then leave them alone. You know, I got this problem. I'm going to run to God. He's going to take care of it. Then I can go do whatever I was doing before all this happened. I like the uh, the illustration you put here as the it's kind of similar to somebody who's you know overweight or they've got this chronic health issue that they can take care of, and they go to the doctor, right? And the doctor tells them about the risks uh, because of the obesity, the risk for cancer, high blood pressure, cholesterol, all those kinds of things. Um, and he tells them to go on a diet, right? And then they go home and they stop by Krispy Kreme and they got, got some donuts. Right. It's kind of like that. Well, it's balanced, right? It's hot dog in one hand and Diet Coke in the other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this patient, it's one of those, he's, it's he's one of those things. one thing, but he's doing something completely different. Exactly. That, that's the whole issue. And, and again, uh, just a quick reading of those verses. You wouldn't get it without getting the whole book of Hosea. So that's why chapter seven is so important to get the context of what's really taking place, because true repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of direction. And that's not what we see here. Right. So we've got we've got we have Israel and their perspective, but their perspective is wrong. It, it's it's not uh, even their perspective on themselves right? it, It's completely uh, wrong right. as far as their repentance. Um, right. And, we and they're looking for a quick fix. You know, th their whole goal is a quick fix. And as we look through, you you pointed out here uh, a psalm, Psalm 51, uh, talking yeah. about God. And it says here that, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to my love and kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash, wash me throughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me 
from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Uh, here, uh, it, continuing through, he talks about purging him with hyssop and, and talking about him being, even being shapen in iniquity. So uh, that's, you know, David, right? And he's, uh, he's, he's, he's telling us, you know, he's, he's coming clean. <laughs> he's right. got the right perspective. Uh, and right. That's, that's what true God. repentance looks like, yeah. not give me a quick fix and then leave me alone. Because they, they would say, we'll get this done in two or three days. In two days, this is going to happen. In three days, this is going to happen. This is, we're just going to be done with this. Whereas David says, obviously says, I'm looking for a life change here, not just a quick fix. You wrote here at kind of towards the end that Israel wanted God to give them a formula uh, to forgive sin, right? It's just cut and dry. Right. It's, it's like, a, it will, I'll, I'll put the quarter in and then we'll get the Coke out, right? It's the, exactly. It's machine right. Relationship right. God. It's a, give me the ritual. Give me the, the, the three steps that I got to do. Right. Yeah. And it's and again, a lot of people have that. They have this ritual that they do and they think everything is OK. But God wants a relationship and a relationship is based on both being on the same page. And that's kind of what we see right in, in false religions and idolatry. It's that right. I give then he gives he gives back to me. It's I, I do these things or I make this sacrifice or I say these things or I chant this many times. Right. Receive. Whatever it is, the, ju the justification, the forgiveness, the blessing, the rain, the whatever it is. Right. Formulaic relationship. Exactly. And so then, then I put in here just kind of a reflection to say, okay, we've, we've seen this in this point. Now, how does this impact us? And we've got to ask ourselves, what, how do we describe our attitude towards our sin? Are we like David? Or are we like the people in Hosea's day? Right. And we have to be careful, I think, too. Um, that we don't trick ourselves into thinking something that we're not. Exactly. That, well, I go to church. Well, I, I give every week, or you know, I'm I'm one of the few people that show up on that for that Wednesday night prayer meeting. You know, it's it's not just those things. Those are an outflow, right, of, of our spirituality. That we should be doing those things, but right. one doesn't necessarily always equal the other. It isn't that cut dry. I put the thing in, so I get it, right? Because even Jesus right. says, "Not everyone who comes to me saying, Lord, Lord." Can enter into the kingdom of heaven. Exactly. Lord, and, there are all these things in your name, right? Yeah. And and how would you like to be in a marriage where it was all like that? You know, it was a formula. We don't want a relationship that's a formula. We're real people. We want a real relationship, not just okay. I get up and I do this. You get up and you do this, and we go through a day doing our our list and everything. We we wouldn't want that in a marriage, and God doesn't want that with us. And certainly, certainly, as you've been as you pastored many years, you've probably seen that, and people have come to you for counsel and. Yeah, well, oh, yeah. I do this, so my wife owes me that. Or I do this. Exactly. So my husband owes me that. It's that machine like relationship, and it never ends well. Right, right. So we see Israel's perspective on God, but then we, number two, see God's perspective on Israel, where God gives Israel his assessment of their character in uh, six vivid pictures. And we'll look at these pretty quickly here. The first picture is a short, lasting morning cloud coming from Hosea chapter six. Verses 4 through 11, it says, o, for, o Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew that goeth away. Therefore have I he, uh, hewed them as prophets. I have slain them with uh, them by the words of my mouth, and thy judgments are as the light that goeth forth. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. There have they dealt treacherously against me. Gilead is as a city of them that work iniquity and is polluted with blood. And as troops of robbers wait for a man, so the company of priests murder in the way by consent, for they commit lewdness. I have seen an horrible thing in the house of Israel. There is a, the whoredom of Ephraim. Uh, Israel is defiled. Also, O Judah, he hath set at a harvest for thee. Will I return the captivity of my people? When I return the captivity of my people. Now, you could do a whole series of messages on these one verses right here, but sure. we've, we've got to we've got to make sure we put everything together and all this because what's happening is they're saying, "I want a quick fix." I, you know, I want this formula that you know all that kind of stuff. So now God's just saying, "Oh, wait a minute. Here's my assessment." You're like a morning cloud. You know, you don't last very long. You know, as soon as the sun comes up, you go away. So God has told Israel that the devotion to him is short-lived at best. It's just not lasting. And then he talks about uh, 
I, I desire the, the uh, don't desire the sacrifice. You know, we get kind of mixed up with kind of those things. But it's like in First Samuel 15, where God is telling us that he is, uh, uh, and Samuel said, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying. And, and that's several places in the Bible where God, he's not doing away with the sacrificial system at all. But when it becomes your ritual, and without a relationship, he says, I don't desire that. That's not what I'm all about. Right. So Israel is like men. They've turned guests against God. Um, you know, you pointed out in Galatians there about not being deceived that God's not mocked that whatsoever man soweth, he shall also reap. And your final reflection, you, you mentioned here that you would describe how we looking at would we describe our devotion to God as a short morning shower or something that lasts <laughs> all day. Right. Right. Are we like the dew that burns up in the heat? Are we gone? Uh, or is our relationship with God flighty at best? Or are right. we something that's, that's going to last? Then you mentioned here, uh, the second uh, illustration is the overheated oven. Uh, from Hosea chapter 7, beginning of verse 1, it says, When I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered and the wickedness of Samaria. For they commit falsehood, and the thief cometh in, and the troop of robbers spoileth without. And they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about. They are before my face. They make the king glad with their wickedness, and the princes with their lies. They are all adulterers, as an oven heated by the baker, who ceaseth, ceaseth from raising after he hath kneaded the dough until it be leavened. In the day of our king, the princes have made him sick with bottles of wine. He stretched out his hand with scorners, for they have made ready their heart like an oven while they lay in wait. Their baker sleepeth all the night, and in the morning it burneth as a fire, flaming fire. They are all hot as an oven and have devoured their judges. All their kings are fallen. There is none among them that calleth unto me. So these verses, God specifically tells Israel what's prevented him from helping them. Because you see, God is calling, you know, calling their bluff or whatever, however you want to say it. But God, Israel wanted God to act on their terms instead of acting on God's terms. And God wrote it all down in Deuteronomy 28. And God's now saying, wait a minute, you can't sin and get away with it. I know all about your sin and remember your sin. You remember, it's God's goal to forget their sin and confess sin is forgiven, but they're not confessing their sin. So God's now having to call them to task. So he says, their desire for sin is like an oven overheated by a baker, which means it's, it's, it's burning hot all night long. A baker just kind of banks the fire at night, cools down, is ready to go in the morning. But they got that just going all night long. And he's saying, that's what your sin is. Your sin is like an oven that just always is on fire, is always hot. And there's nothing that can good come out of it. I don't know if you've ever had that experience, if you've baked much or anything like that. But if you get, you know, you get that, te that temperature too hot it cooks too fast it's nasty in the middle it's burnt on the top right yeah you know, I've, I've always always uh, inter uh love the illustration of you know you you can burn a cake and then you can you can try to you know cover it with icing and make it look nice but once you cut into that and you taste it you can't get that burnt taste out right it's exactly not, no. no matter how much you try to try to fake it how much you try to cover up same thing with our sin right you can't cover it up it's it's like a burnt cake <laughs> it's like a burnt cake yeah. You can't get anything good out of an overheated oven. So you, you mentioned yeah. our reflection. Yeah, that an overheated oven describes a life focused on sin. And, you know, we've really seen people like that, that whatever, if they're working, they're just working to make money for their sin. You know, whatever it is, they're just focused on their sin. And we got to ask our question, is there sin in our life that's controlling us? And are we ready to properly deal with that sin, sin and get victory over it? The next one kind of carries on this Baker theme. It's the half right. Cake, uh, coming from chapter seven, verse eight, it says, "Ephraim he hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned." Yeah. So yeah, he carries that theme through. It was common in those days to break bread on hot rocks, and if it, the dough's not turned over, it's burned on one side and it's uncooked on the other side. And this is really addressing their political alliances instead of trusting in God. So some of their political alliances have burned them, and others have left them uncooked. You know, so. All their alliances are not working out like they want to. So then we say, are you a half-baked Christian? Do you have some alliances with this world that are keeping you from a life completely given to God? And neither one of those is very good, right? The burnt side. No. <laughs> the raw side is not good either. 
No. We've got Ephraim yeah. the half-baked cake. Then we've got the ignorant old man. Uh, continuing, verse 9 says that strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are he here and there upon him, yet he knoweth not. And the pride of Israel testify to his face, and they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. So this is kind of personal, old man, you know. <laughs> and I understand that we don't want to give up on anything. We want to pretend that we're as strong as we ever were. Our brains function like they've always functioned and all that kind of stuff. So we, we can try to ignore it, but it, it, it shows up. And so Israel's pictured as an old man who doesn't know he's lost his youthful strength. Or the color of his hair. I mean, it's the old thing of you play volleyball all your life and all of a sudden you play volleyball and oh, I hurt so bad because <laughs> you're just not 18 anymore, you know. But by ignoring God's law, Israel was losing its strength and didn't know it. And I first thing I thought about was Samson, yep. you know, lost his strength, didn't know it. And then in Revelation, where they, they think they're all these things, but but they're not. They're wretched, they're miserable, you know. And sometimes we can get away from God and not really know that we've drifted. You know, that's kind of the reflection on the, all this. You know, some, a lot of times we've been on a, a lake or something in, in an inner tube or a raft or something. And then said, look how far I'm away from shore. We didn't even know it. And sometimes we've drifted from God and don't even know it. And we feel like everything's OK and it's not. The next illustration we see here from verses 11 and 12 is a silly dove. Verses 11 and 12 say Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt, they go to Assyria. When they shall go, I will spread my net upon them. I will bring them down as the fowls of the heaven. I will chastise them as their congregation hath hurt. Yeah, they're, they're just flitt flittering back and forth like a silly dove. Israel turned to Egypt and to Syria, and both nations are going to prove to be false allies. Israel's leaders thought they were the wise ones, and we know what to do with this. But God's prophets had told him what to do, and they, they just ignored it. Um, in Hosea chapter 10, uh, we, have, we're not, we haven't been, got there yet, but you mentioned here a couple verses. Is in verse right. five, chapters 10, verse 5 and 6, it says, The inhabitants of Samaria shall fear because of the calves of Beth Haven, for the people thereof shall mourn over it, and the priests thereof that rejoiced on it for the glory thereof, because it is departed from it. It shall also... Uh, it shall be also carried unto Assyria for the present uh, to King Jerob. Ephraim shall receive shame and Israel shall be ashamed of his own counsel. Yeah, we're going to really get to this in a future lesson about the calves worship that they were involved in. But in, in like a silly dove, Israel has flown to Egypt and to Assyria. And God told him he would catch him in his net and give them to Assyria. So, God, not the kings, is the wise man here. So they think they know what they're doing, but God just lays on line. You're a silly dove. You're not wise at all. Finally, we look at here the worthless bow uh, from verses 13 through 16. Scripture says, Woe unto them, for they have fled from me, destruction unto them, because they have transgressed against me. Though I have redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. And they have not cried unto me with their heart when they howled upon their bed. They assemble themselves for corn and wine, and they rebel against me. Though I have bound and strengthened their arms, yet do they imagine mischief against me. They return, but not only, but not to the Most High. They are like a deceitful bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the rage of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. Yeah, deceitful bow is a bow that looks good, but it's worthless. That's why it's a deceitful bow. It may bend or break as an arrow is drawn, but the arrow is not going to go to its target. And God is now saying to Israel, you are a worthless bow. God could not depend on them to be faithful. You know, uh, and in the reflection, I kind of talk about that. Can God depend on us? Can God depend on you? He's saying, I can't depend on you. I can't depend on you to do anything I've told you to do. And we, we talk about our dependence on God, but, but God wants us to accomplish a lot in this world for his sake, for his honor, for his glory. And when he calls us to do something, are we going to be his ambassador in this world like he wants us to be? I like that you have end here with the idea of, from James chapter one about the idea of looking into a mirror. And, and James here says, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if anyone be here, 
of the word and not a doer. He's like a man uh, beholden his natural face in a, gla a glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. And that's really kind of the whole synopsis of this lesson, right? It's the idea of having the right perspective. Right. Israel didn't have the right perspective of God. They didn't have the right, right perspective of themselves. Yet God kind of lays it out there. Here's who you are. You're like a, a baker who's left his oven on all night long. You're un, unbaked bread. You're a silly dove. You're a, 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 a worthless bow uh, and such. And he kind of lays it out there. Here, here's who you really are. And I wonder, uh, I wonder when we look into scripture, right? Do we have, are we able to see those things that certainly God wants to, show us from scripture who we truly are um, right we, you know, as james say if we look into that perfect law of liberty and we go away forgetting all those things that we see that we need to change well yeah. then we are certainly certainly foolish like israel yeah yeah there are times when you can say i'm not really sure what god's saying but he gave them six distinct pictures so they, they we can't get away with it this time <laughs> exactly well thank you so much for your, your lesson um, and uh, our, certainly our prayer is, is that as we look into the word of God this week, that we would be changed, that we would see the areas that we need to change and make those changes, have the right perspective of ourselves. And teachers, uh, our prayer for you today, for you this week is that you would do the same both in your life and then helping your uh, class to be able to see the importance of using God's word as that mirror, having the right perspective. And ultimately, our goal, our target to what to look like is Jesus. Right. That was absolutely our prayer for you. Let's pray together and that uh, will be done. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the word of God, uh, the clarity that it gives to us. Father, help us to have the right perspective, Lord, to not be foolish uh, like Israel, to believe that our relationship with you can be just some kind of uh, canned uh, machine like ritual that is empty. Father, I pray that you would help us to have the right perspective of who we are in light of you. Father, if there are things that we need to change, Father, help us as teachers to change them in our own hearts, not expecting our 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 our, uh, our class uh, to and and our friends to, to do that, and and we're we're left untouched. Father, I pray that you would break us first, help us have the right perspective, help us to be holy and to and to pursue holiness in our lives, uh, Father, so that you might be able to use us uh, as we teach this coming week. Thank you for all that you do and for your word. Now we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Lewis. Thank you for your time and thank you for your great this great lesson. Uh, teachers will be praying for you this week.